So let's say one company was praising from the rooftops mm -hmm. that there was a vaccine yeah. that worked. And somebody was like, I don't know if I trust them. They stand to make a lot of money on that. Yeah. I think that's totally fair. And their incentive is to lie. Well, did the FDA sign off on it? That's one check. Maybe the FDA is compromised by some, okay, whatever. What about the other capitalist companies in the United States that were trying to make vaccines but failed? Don't they have an incentive to call out those other companies? Or let's go out of the United States. If we're making faulty mRNA vaccines, right? Russia, the Soviet Union accused us of faking moon shit. China's accused us of all sorts of shit. Why wouldn't they say America America's lying to you about the mRNA vaccines. Well, unless it's like a world government. I don't, yeah, I don't just believe in world government. Are you just feeding into the same insanity? Instead of looking at this as a dichotomy of like left versus right, and I wanna be like keeping the tension, like can't we view it as like truth versus untruth or information versus misinformation, where we're pushing in a direction where we're just trying to be more honest instead of more ideological? You don't because, like me? Yeah. Let's go. You got wow, it made, bro. Thank you so much. Wow. Good job. Let's go. You no. got it made. Yo. Hold 9-11. Yeah, so you're unconvinced. Totally. I'm gonna be honest with you. Before I watched it, I thought maybe 93 was shot down. I yeah. could buy that. Yeah. But after watching this, I'm like, damn, I think 93 actually happened exactly as the official Why? story Why? says. Why was it not convincing? One, I didn't know there were so many people in the area that would have heard F-16s or taken video of stuff coming through. Mm -hmm. And two, this documentary that tries to make the argument that it was shot down, all they cite is some weird white plane. What white plane? I haven't seen this in a million years. What white plane? I don't know. They just say there's a... Now, the the official story is that there was a white plane flying through that was a private jet, uh -huh. and the towers radioed them to go and fly by the 93 crash site to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But they say that might have been a military plane that went by to shoot it down. Oh. Why the f*** would we fly mysterious white planes to shoot it down? Why yeah. wouldn't we just scramble F-16s? I, I don't know. I don't remember. I haven't seen this one in a million years. Oh, yeah? Do you yeah. remember any of the arguments from you? I, I remember the uh, NORAD... Uh, that that it was like there was a drill or something or whatever that day, and I remember um, the uh, plumes of smoke. What do they call that? That shot out from the building when the charges were detonated. The maintenance on the elevator shaft, the so, explosion okay. in the lobby. Yeah, so I'm curious. So now I've read, <laughs> I've gone through all yeah, of this so now. You're, yeah, you're, you're now I've gone through all of it. So the smoke shooting out the side. Why couldn't that have just been from pressures or explosions that happen inside the building as it's collapsing or as like the molten like aluminum is going down the tower? Is that not possible? Um, I don't know. I'm not an engineer. Okay. Then the second question is we can go and look up videos of like buildings being exploded. Yeah. Yeah. And you can hear the charges. Like we can, if you want, we yeah. can watch. It's like, you could hear, I think you'd hear it when I, no, no, no. Yeah, so on the tower is you hear like a, <laughs> but for the controlled demolition, it's like, like you hear, like, because yeah. you have to do a sequence, you got to do a whole sequence to do like a controlled demolition. Uh -huh. So why don't we hear any of that ever? And- I think you do hear it though. So some people say you hear it, because yeah. people are like, we heard explosions. Right. But the mysterious thing about that is once the first two towers are down and tower seven comes down, yeah. that's hours later. Right. Now we've got all sorts of video cameras, all sorts of audio, all sorts of media. Why don't we hear any charges there? That's when at the real recordings are starting. Mm. Notice how the only charges we get for the first two. What recordings of the audio do we have from World Trade Center 7? Everything. Everybody's recording it. What do you mean? The, the there, whole world is watching. Remember? Because that was a big yeah, thing with the people. Like what? Like, are there videos with audio of that? Because I haven't seen yeah. videos. Yeah. I mean, there's videos like of it all coming down. In close proximity where you would hear it? I mean, we can go and look them up. But I'm going to, here's the assumption that I would make is that if there was video in close proximity hearing explosions, they probably would have put it in the five hour documentary. Well, here's the thing. It's like. <laughs> uh, I would if imagine. You, if you, I don't, I don't know. I just think that if, well. I'll put that on a shelf for one second okay. and say, what do you think about World Trade Center 7? Do you, you buy the official explanation that it just was like so hot in there that it came down? Because that to me is just like a smoking gun. The, so there's two possibilities. One is all the debris and everything from the other towers plus all of the fires raging in that tower brought it down. Mm -hmm. Or two, what? a crack team of explosive experts were sent in by the government prior to that to set up a de demolition of the largest building that has ever been demolished in the history of demolitions. B by the way, that's way shorter than the other two buildings that were supposedly demolished. They would have also been the largest in the history of all demolitions. And nobody saw anything, nobody caught anything, no charges were recorded, no explosive powder or residue was found yeah. in any... So like, maybe my story has like a little bit of kind of a weird thing, but if you were to actually plot out your story, there'd be like a billion, like what the f happened? How yeah, did people get like, into the towers? How did no, nobody see anything? Buildings don't just fall down. Like, because you understand that the Twin Towers were built particularly to withstand an impact from a jet engine. From and a 707. 
Not a 757 or a 777 or the 757 or the whatever the Airbus model was. Point being is these are these are very strong structures with the core, and then they also have a steel frame as they well. They do, yeah. So there's a lot of redundancy. There is a lot of redundancy. Plane I agree. Plane hits, plane hits, towers go down. It's like okay, now now you could say oh well it was very hot, fire was burning for a long time, all this. Uh, but then it's like okay, well the, here's the tower it wasn't even hit by a plane. It was just next to the buildings were hit by the planes, and that one came down. Why, okay, let's that. say it was a controlled demolition. Mm -hmm. Why would they wait seven hours later to bring it down? I don't know. I don't know why they would do that. Why can't we hear any explosion, explosions from Tower 7? I, I don't know that we can't hear any explosions. We can't. It would have been in here. They would have included that's, it in the video. But that's not evidence to say, like, well, if there was... Why was there no explosive it. residue found in Tower 7? Why was there no reports well, of people going in and out? Who would, who would Everybody, the whole, anybody in the world could have walked around any of these areas. That's just not true. That's just not true. It is true because there was that one report that was submitted to an open journal that was never verified by anybody else where they said they found a little bit of thermite on the collapse of the North Tower or whatever. Mm -hmm. So somebody, obviously people are getting residue somehow, but I imagine anybody could have walked by and picked up some shit. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I haven't, again, I haven't, I'm, I'm not. I'm going to be honest. I'm a big believer of the official story now. Before I was like, damn, I don't know. But now I kind of, now after looking at everything, I'm like, damn, the official story holds the up pretty is, well. Though, you, I mean, I, I think it goes back to what we talked about a few months ago. Which uh -huh. is you, but really, you have a different ideological disposition about this stuff. I think that it's not. I know, I know you just went through the video, no, ahead, but yeah. you even said you went into the video with like the intention of like debunking it. Like I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to debunk everything. And you're going to say, well, I'm going to fact check it. I'm going to check everything out. And, and, and I understand what you mean by that. But I think that there's like on a fundamental level, you, like you have an ideological assumption about conspiracies. And I think that's I... the real difference. Because totally I'm not saying, hold on. Yeah, First okay. of all, we both have differences at an ideological level. That's true. Which is fine. Yeah. But the important thing is, how do we arrive at what we believe to be true? Right. I'm willing to look, and I did. I looked through this whole fucking video. I re, I had a fan that actually emailed one of the um, engineers, and he responded, really? shitting on this documentary. The engineer? Um, yes, the guy that um, uh, the guy that talks about how uh, is the towers are falling. There's only one way or whatever. Um, fuck. Hold on. What's this guy's name? Oh, David Chandler. And it's really funny because he actually did work, because he's apparently another 9-11 truther. He actually did work disproving the frame difference in how the Pentagon cameras lined up. Because in this documentary, they make the right, argument right. They that, talk like, about oh, they edited it out of frame. But they didn't edit out of frame. These things are shooting one frame per second. Of course, you can miss something from one camera to another. Mm -hmm. And he actually has a truck in the background where he does the math to prove mm. that, oh, actually, yeah, they were just misaligned a bit. There's, you don't need a weird, it wasn't edited. But um, but anyways, you're saying about where are I'm just saying I'm just looking yeah I'm looking for truth. If if I were to if you were to let's say we take a highly complicated event which 9/11 was right. regardless of how it happened it's very complicated yeah right um, you're gonna be able to find a lot of things that look weird or like that's pretty strange we can find that even in like one off events that yeah. like oh my god like if I would have left two seconds later from my house I would have gotten a car accident right things like that happen. But the thing is, I don't have an alternate story to attack mm -hmm. because you can poke holes in mine and try to ask questions. But if you were to lay out your story, we could we would make like a 50 hour video because the story that is running that is being ran in this is that planes took off. Mm -hmm. Military drones took their place. The civilian airliners landed somewhere. Nobody saw them. No military bases are reporting anything when they landed. Federal agents of some kind got people out of the planes, made them make phone calls to their families, and then assassinated all of them. Yeah. And nobody found any bodies, nobody's heard anything or whatever. Military drones flew into the planes. Nobody saw or was able to get a good enough picture to see it was a military drone. While they flew into the planes, at the same time, there were charges that were rigged to blow these up that there's no good audio recordings of. The tallest building in the world that's ever been brought down by charges, I think, is 44 stories tall. To the two yeah, towers. Right, you're, you're, giving okay, closing, I'm, you're giving. Yeah, I'm sorry. Statement. Sorry, sorry hold on. Statement. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> All I'm saying is that, like, if I look at your story, and I'm, that's like we're not even halfway through. There's a lot of wild shit going on. There's a lot of stuff to account for. Yeah. But look, here's the thing. I mean, we could we could do the. I mean, we're doing the JFK debate. Well, I, right. well, are we doing this debate? Because I mean, well, is the JFK one going to be as dumb as this? Because this is like what oh, I'm this saying is, is what I'm saying is we we we're doing the JFK debate. We could do a 9/11 debate if you. I thought we were doing a 9/11 debate. That's why I fucking. I thought you were doing that with Sneeko. Oh, you were his representative. No, no. We're not supposed not to be today. fighting for his soul. Well, you're you going to bear his soul dude, to me, I and won. I'm going to take his. His soul's totally. Well, I don't know, well it's not man. mine. It belongs to uh, Hitler. No, <laughs> it belongs to reactionaries. It belongs to the right wing. But here's the thing 
Uh, we could do the 9-11 debate. We could debate about the particulars or the JFK debate. Because I didn't, I didn't prepare to do a... We could do uh, the JFK debate if you want to. I'll do that one next. Uh, that I got to prepare for that. I got to oh, okay, prepare okay, for that. But, okay. um, just like you prepared for this. You went, you just watch five hours of 9-11. Yeah, because you told me to. Because it was on my I, fucking I was on the schedule. beach this weekend, okay? It was on my schedule, Nick. Yeah, I know. It was scheduled. Yeah, 9 11 Sneeko, debate. Sneeko is debating on this today, not me. My, I'm doing the JFK debate, remember? That was the schedule. But... Um, but the point. Are you going to be in town for the JFK debate? I'll do that one. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. In a couple weeks. All right. Or no, not not here. I'll be back. No. Home. Yeah. Okay. All right. But um, the point I'm trying to make is I don't know that because I talk about this, for example, with a friend of mine called Classical Theist. He's a big Catholic guy, and he says that it's futile to argue sometimes the historiography argument for Christ's existence because people that don't believe in the metaphysical idea of God can come up with any way to dismiss the historical evidence. You could say, look at the Gospels. You could say, look at Josephus, look at this and that. And they'll say, oh, well, what if the apostles were lying? Oh, well, what if there's a mistranslation? Oh, what, if, what about that? And, and I feel like there's something similar about the conspiracies where it's like, I could come up with a lot of things where it's like, sow the seeds of doubt and say there's things unaccounted for, and you could find a number of reasons to dismiss that. I think there's something about our assumptions about the world, which is why, and, and the foundation is, I think things are not as they seem. And you are willing to say, oh, they basically are as they seem. Okay, but here's the difference between me and you, okay? Okay. Yeah. What's the difference between me Even and you? Even today, uh -huh. I won't say it's impossible that 9-11 was a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. There is something that you could show me okay. that I'd be like... That's really weird. Mm -hmm. a, a, a cable is leaked and Cheney is talking in advance about how like we need to make sure that these guys are not in this place or some bomb team is discovered and it's like these guys had expert. But, or, there is data out there that could convince me otherwise. I don't think you could be convinced. Mm -hmm. No, I could. With what? Well, here's the thing. I mean, when I approach these things, like with COVID, when COVID was going on, well, I was like 9-11. Okay, well, what could possibly convince you? That it, that it was Al-Qaeda, an organization that has a history of doing it, that came out and took credit for it, that had the planning to do anything. Like, what part of that doesn't, like... Well, I mean, if I if I went through and watched... May, I got, maybe I'll watch your stream. Maybe I'll watch your stream you do about this documentary. It's three days I'll, I'll of horribly... Convinced. It's like 30 well, hours of shit. But I'm dedicated to the truth. The thing is, though, when it comes to these things, I'm, I'm always willing to think that it's the main story, the official story, whatever. Really, I am. But it's just that... When I look at the world, I don't necessarily see uh, complex schemes and plans, but I, I do see a willingness and an ability to conspire, which is what I kept getting back to on the Sneeko stream. I'm not trying to convince you uh, that they did the remote control plane and they shot everybody at a CIA black site. I'm not trying to convince you of that. I'm trying to convince you that if they're willing and able, then that raises doubt. And that means we have to, we do have to lay it out and evaluate these things sure. and not rely on benefit of the doubt. That's I think I'm that's saying. a good, and I think that's okay. like a good starting place. Yeah. But like, why not ask those very same questions of, um, of Al Qaeda? Fuck, I wrote it down. I think I deleted it. But like, were they, did, were they willing? Yes. Did they have the capabilities of doing it? Yes. Did they take credit for it? Yes. Yeah, and I, so I, like, that's a thing. And like Al Qaeda had every reason to want, like the um, Bin Laden released like a whole statement for all the different reasons why he wanted to go and after the us. Fatwa and, and, yeah, and his fatwa. Yeah, his fatwa. Yeah, and everything was there. Like the uh, the towers had already been attacked in '93, unless you think that was the government yeah, as well. Yeah, the World Trade Center bombing in '93. Yeah. Um, so I mean, like, it, like there's yeah, they've well, attacked them before. They have a history of doing these types of like multiple suicide bombing attacks, and they continue to do so. Yeah, but we're we're not talking about. I the, I agree with you. I'm saying yeah, uh -huh. Al Qaeda is willing and able, and that's the official story. What I'm saying is we're talking about the willingness and the ability for like deception for a large scale deception, which is which is about it's about how the truth bends around power. The power is telling you the official story. The, and whether you whether you like it or not, the American media, the government is power. They wield power and they, they wield power through money and military and things like that. They're very mm -hmm. organized. Sure. And so I agree with you, the Taliban okay. or Al Qaeda, whatever, yeah. willing and able to carry it out, but the government is willing and able to carry out these attacks and then do a mass deception. So this is what I don't like. I agree with everything you're saying, but you have to swap out I don't believe in the government. Okay. I don't think our government is that unified. We've got a ton of different, it's like okay. a, well, but that's important. So for instance, if you ask me, could the United States have conspired to do 
the question would be, what does that conspiracy look like? Mm. And when I say conspiracy, I mean it like in the literal like planning sense. And if it's like a multi-agency thing spanning hundreds or thousands of people, that my initial assumption is going to be very, 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 very low. Now, if you were to ask me, do you think the government lied for um, fabricating a reason to go into Iraq? Well, who was involved in that fabrication? In that, there was one office created by Bush and Cheney, the Office of Special Plans. And that was the sole office that we got unvetted information through to justify going to Iraq. Right. Now, if you tell me there's a conspiracy there, yeah, maybe. Because now we don't have 20 different agencies that would have had to have been aboard as just one. And they're answering to people that do have yeah. an ideological desire or drive to get into Iraq. So, and I don't even think that is a conspiracy. That, like The idea that that office was created and yeah, took we, unvetted- Yeah, we don't disagree yeah. with that. But the, the difference, but the difference, but the difference is, I'm not talking the government. The difference is, are we talking like one agency? Or are we talking multi agency? Because when multiple agencies get involved, shit gets way more complicated. And the chances of a huge conspiracy against the American people, because that would be a disgustingly horrible thing, yeah. right? Like it's one thing to sell weapons to Iran or to fuck with South American governments, but to murder all those people on the planes, to do the planes into the towers. That's a tall order, even for one agency to do. For multiple agencies to conspire on that, oof, that's a that's our that's our brothers and sisters, sisters our American brothers and sisters mm. working as Fed sometimes. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I agree with you that it's uh, it's something that is visceral and it is upsetting and it, it does seem outlandish. But I think that when you and I agree with you about talking about intelligence agencies and a particular group or whatever. Um, when I say the government, I'm using that as a shorthand for people that are in power. People that are in power, whether than intel agencies or Silicon Valley or corporations, they conspire. And you know, once you're open to the idea that you're being deceived actively, that, that some of your assumptions are based on wrong information, that's based on a conspiracy, then you have to go into it. You have to look into it. And the problem is that, I mean, you could say, oh, well, you know, your conspiracy is irrational. Your conspiracy is this and that. But it's like, these things are banned. These things are censored. I know this documentary happens to be on YouTube, but I don't think you would argue that there's not censorship. There is censorship in tech companies for sure. But not only is this documentary on YouTube, it's literally hosted on the CIA website. <laughs> it's hosted on CIA it website? Is hosted. It is actually like, I don't know why. But um, it's it's there's literally a copy of the book for this on CIA.gov. Well, is it documentary on here? Or is it the? Um, I it? I know that the the whole um, uh, the whole script for the thing is hosted here. I don't know if the actual video is, but um, so I mean, it's not like this is being suppressed. Point being is though, <laughs> you're. Yeah. But I think you would agree there's censorship. It's, I think it's literally that's in the true. Terms but of the service. difference is that like what it like. What is the censorship? Like, where is it coming from? Like, is it the United States government saying we need to hide all of this? Or is it tech companies trying to cover their ass against like bad publicity or whatever? Like, I'm not saying that conspiracies are impossible. Mm -hmm. I just look like the, the vaccines, you brought up the vaccines earlier. That's a really good one, okay? So let's say one company was praising from the rooftops mm -hmm. that there was a vaccine that yeah. worked, okay? And somebody was like, I don't know if I trust them. They stand to make a lot of money, a lot of money on that. That's fair. I yeah. think that's totally fair. And their incentive is to lie, right? right? Well, did the FDA sign off on it? Okay, that's one check. Okay, maybe the FDA is compromised by some, okay, whatever. What about the other capitalist companies in the United States that were trying to make vaccines but failed? Because a lot of them tried and they failed. Don't they have an incentive to call out those other companies? So that's like, where, that's why I'm looking at incentives. Why aren't those companies calling out Pfizer and Moderna? Or let's go out of the United States. What about Russia or China? If we're making faulty mRNA vaccines, right? Russia, the Soviet Union accused us of faking moon shit. China's accused us of all sorts of shit. Why wouldn't they say America's lying to you about the mRNA vaccines? If we're gonna look at some incentives here, why not look at the worldwide incentives to see why people aren't calling us out for what's obviously like a, unless it's like a world government. I don't, yeah, I don't believe in world government. And here's the thing, when it comes to things like the vaccine, I, I'm not one of these people that says, oh, you know, George Soros is creating a depopulation agenda and then this kind of thing and they're poisoning the water. I think the water. I think the water is being poisoned. I That's don't why think I drink it's Red Bull. Deliberate yeah. though, but um, but the thing is, I think what it concerns is a confluence of interest, meaning that different people come together for different reasons that are all beneficial to them to carry out things that are against our interests, and and it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. It's like the government. I wanted to reopen the economy, I think, ultimately. I think that the government wanted commerce to restart. I think they wanted to create you know more tax again. 
And so how are they gonna do that? Well, they needed to change public opinion. How are they gonna change public opinion? Get the vaccination rates up. I think that everybody, so, so with the vaccine in particular, I don't know that people got together and said, let's make faulty vaccines to kill everybody. But I think that profit making enterprises had an incentive to make the vaccines the government would buy. I think the government had an incentive to buy vaccines, whatever came out, and sell them to the public. I think the corporations had an incentive to push the vaccines to get their businesses open. And that's how a lot of people can come together. And maybe in 10 years, this mRNA, which is experimental, people find out, oh, there were unforeseen consequences. Oh, it turns out that maybe the vaccines weren't the best idea. But in that moment, you know, maybe Pfizer didn't call up the government and government called up Walmart and said, hey, let's kill everyone with vaccines. But, you know, they all had, again, this confluence of self-interest to push something which is not in the best interest of the people. And that's because the people are more disorganized than the power. Sure, so then let's say that I buy all of that and I'll ignore the... I'll ignore the motivations on the other end because mm -hmm. there is going to be a motivation not to sell a bad vaccine because a bad medication can destroy your company, right? No, because the vaccine manufacturers are immune from liability. No, 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 no. Like their stock would be destroyed. Like nobody would invest in these. They might not get sued, but like the company's going to lose a lot of faith. The companies have gone bankrupt on bad medications, veterans. But we'll ignore all of that, okay? Here's the issue that I have with your worldview because I feel like I'm more open to a, a plethora of possibilities than you are. Let's say that it was the case that the mRNA vaccines represent a crowning achievement of American innovation mm -hmm. and American capitalism. Mm -hmm. That there are companies across the world that only exist because of American capital. BioNTech that um, helped to do the research and creation of those mRNA vaccines, that only existed because I think in the 90s, Pfizer bailed them out and they gave them like a huge cash infusion in order to keep them running. That's why it's Pfizer BioNTech, right? And the manufacturing for these things is worldwide. I think we like there's part, like the nanolipid particles are made in like fucking Switzerland and like all, right? So we have a story of amazing American innovation, amazing success of American capitalism to deliver a vaccine faster than ever to the entire world that we've distributed to everybody. That is an immensely, that's an amazing, and it's an amazingly positive story, but you can never see that story. Because in your mind, well, there could be nefarious actors and like you can never see past that. No, I, I disagree. I disagree. I mean, I- So what would it take to convince you that like the mRNA vaccines were good? <laughs> well, well, you're not gonna convince me that, but, but here's the thing. I, well, uh, what I will say- You could say, convince me they're bad. If, start, if data started rolling out and people are coming out with fucking three arms out of their head or some shit, or some shit started happening, you'd be like, yeah, okay, fuck, yeah, this was bad. I, well, but I like, just have a general distrust of- uh, Everything? Medication and- But it can't be medication. You have a distrust of the capitalist system, of our companies. No, you have a distrust I don't have of the a... FDA, of other countries, of other academic- You distrust everybody at that point. Well, yeah, I'm skeptical. I'm a skeptic of-, of Everything? Uh, well, yeah, I am skeptical. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. I'm a conservative, which means that I trust sort of like, I trust my instincts, I trust my intuition, I trust age old institutions, like I trust religion. Okay, that is the dumbest thing in the world because all the whole center point of like trust is, is faith in God, which by definition is like unempirical. So how, yeah. how can the foundation of your belief system be trust in a God that you can't see, hear, prove anything at all? But you can't trust like other people well, or structures say, or out. systems. I, like, yeah. When I say I trust religion, I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about the conservative disposition is based on the idea that things that are old that are now still going on, you know, there's probably something to their composition which has made them last a long time. It's a survivorship bias, which is to say that if if there's a 1,000 year old tradition and we're still here after a thousand years, it's like. Maybe there's something in that tradition that we don't even maybe understand why it works, but it works, that's why it's still here. So maybe we should just keep doing it because if we change it too much, maybe we'll inadvertently change the thing which is keeping us going. And that that's the basis of a, that's the difference between conservative and liberal. Liberal which are very dynamic and say, we have all these new ideas, we have a new way of doing something. And conservative that says, whoa, slow down. What we have here is working. We're all alive right now. And that's what, I, that's what I mean when I say, I trust religion. I trust certain things. And the things that I trust are things that are old, things that are ancient, things from a long time ago. These like new, science is new. And I, I don't always distrust empirical knowledge. I don't always entrust rational knowledge. I don't always distrust the scientific method. I believe in space. <laughs> I love Elon Musk, okay? I think SpaceX is cool. Okay. I love capitalism. I'm not like a communist. 
I love capitalism. I think American industry is amazing. I think MR, you know, the companies that made mRNA are How incredible. do you choose, how do you figure out then what you trust? Because, so I would agree that there needs to be a natural tension anchoring us in the past mm-hmm. and pulling yeah. us forward in the future. Yeah, yeah. That, like, I'll quote the great lady Nancy Pelosi said, we need a strong Republican Party, okay? <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. not the Republican Party you want, but I agree with that. True. But the past wasn't always the best, okay? Mm-hmm. If you fall out of a building or if you get sick, you're going to a modern yeah, hospital. You're not going to eat a fucking tree or some root or whatever, right? There are things that have been good that are modern that are very new. Totally agree. Right? So... So you can't just appeal to I trust things that are old and have worked in the past because yeah. there are new yeah. So how do you figure out like well, what do I trust and what don't that, I trust? That's what this is about. That's what this tension and this dialectic is about. Because because you're right, and I'm I'm not I'm not like a total close-minded stodgy guy. Because I agree with you. Like there are people that are like we need to wear old-timey clothes and do old-timey everything, and it's like that's role play. Society moves forward. Time moves forward. We can't repeat the past, but there are things of value in the past. And, and you're right. The question is, how much do we change? How much do we trust? That's an open-ended question. Now, my job as somebody that does my show is to challenge the government. My job is to challenge the national security apparatus. And the reason why I think I don't have as much responsibility as maybe you think I do, and people get on my case even from my side. They're like, you hate women too much, or you, know, you, you say too much racist things or whatever. And it's like, the way I see it, there is so much moving against those trends that if I'm being extra, if I'm if I have a superfluous amount of skepticism or I push a conspiracy, it's not, you know, totally sourced or whatever, it's like, well, you could turn on the television any channel any day of the week and get the government line and get the thing that you're pushing. So it's my job to be the bulwark and be the reactionary position against all of it. Because you look at a thing like, I mean, you could say people were falling out of buildings and, and all this a long time ago. It's like, okay, well, what about, what about things like cigarettes or like plastics? Plastics seem like a good idea. Now they pollute everything. And now, now it's a total ecological disaster, which cannot be easily reversed. And, you know, it's almost like if somebody were there 100 years ago saying, hey, plastics are horrible. And people would be like, why? It's an amazing story of American innovation. We're creating all these cheap products and it's totally sterile and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, I just don't trust it. I think it's crap. Well, now plastics, microplastics and so on in the soil, air, water, major ecological disaster for animals, fish, hormones, etc. So, like, science can be wrong sometimes. The government can be wrong sometimes. Capitalism can be wrong sometimes. This is a science is a liar sometimes argument. That's from exactly. It's always in Philadelphia, but yeah, given unironically. That, yeah. Like, again, the, the problem I have is that everything you're saying is it's always half true, but this is the issue that I have on the progressive side as well, that mm-hmm. everything is only half true. So you have this idea that sometimes science can be pushed too far, mm-hmm. or sometimes things that initially appear good can have negative side effects in the future, but those are always things that you try to account for, and then you adjust your behavior as you go on through time. You would never say that this could potentially be a bad thing in the future, therefore we just totally omit this entire line of research or technology going forward, because then you would miss out on things that are genuinely probably really positive innovations that like shelter, right? For a long time in human history, we had like teepees or igloos or whatever the fuck. Buildings are pretty cool. I think they're probably here to stay. Yeah. Um, unless I guess the Mossad takes all of them down in New York or whatever. Mm-hmm. But so yeah, it seems like there are some, you know, computers are pretty cool. Maybe we spend too much time on them, but I, I like this idea or here's, I guess what makes me uncomfortable in your world is it feels like it almost feels like you acknowledge that there's a more rational position that you could inhabit, but instead you feel some obligation to be the pole against the unreasonable of the left by being unreasonable on the right. Because that's almost what it sounds like you're saying. You're saying like, it almost sounds like you're saying a reasonable position would be the official story of 9-11 is probably true, although some of it's kind of weird, but you can go to any news station and see that. So it's my job to be the counter voice, to be as fucking reactionary as possible, um, to, to, to be this multipolar force against the progressive left on every single issue. But then at some point, are you just feeding into the same insanity? Like, Instead of looking at this as a dichotomy of like left versus right, and I want to be like keeping the tension, like can't we view it as like truth versus untruth or information versus misinformation where we're pushing in a direction where we're just trying to be more honest instead of more ideological? Because it feels like that's your pull right now. Well, here's the thing. If you watch my show, and I don't know, I don't think you do, but if you watch my show, I will give like a very precise take, which is really actually not as radical as people take me to be. Like, for example, we went on the stream with Sneeko and all them, and you said, oh, well, you just want whites to be separate and blah, blah, blah. And I say on my show every night, like, look, America is a multiracial country. It's going to become more multiracial over time. 
we're going to have to figure out how to live with that. People say, we need to secede and we need to break apart. And I'm like, yeah, that's just not going to happen. We need to deal with what we have. We need to work with the central government and we need to figure out a solution which is acceptable to everybody. Now that is like a precise thing, which I think probably you would even agree with to the extent that you think that diversity can cause some issues. I think you would also say, well, those issues are things we're going to have to simply manage. But I also get taken a lot out of context a lot of times. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't give voice and play devil's advocate because you've got the mainstream media, you've got this, and you've got to admit, I know you agree with the Ukraine stuff and you agree with COVID, but they have, there's a very powerful propaganda machine that exists in the world, which is the American media, American Silicon Valley and big tech, the American government. It's very powerful and it's it's almost monolithic. You know, when, when they're pushing Ukraine, when they're pushing COVID, it, they're all pushing the same direction, except Fox News, 50%. Because Fox News isn't even really pushing my position or the opposite position. They're pushing like a moderated version of everyone else's position. And so it's like, that's a, that, I feel like that's where we, that's where the kind of the rubber meets the road with our difference is you don't really seem to give too much. You'll say, oh, sure, but you don't really seem to t meditate too much on what a scary prospect it is to have such a massive government, such a massive NAT security apparatus, massive big tech media, how they appear to collude, how they appear to be monolithic in many ways, the impact of technology. I feel like you just don't, you don't really, you worry about like, maybe not you, because you're, you're a little different than the others, but people worry too much about what some crazy MAGA boomer is gonna say online about QAnon, but they're like not worried about lying into the war in Iraq or lies about Russia or lies about everything sure. else. I mean, you can, we can be worried about lots of different things. There's lots of different things to worry about. Okay, but like, well, that's I what agree. you do though. You're like, well, we can worry about a lot of things. Like, what about worrying about the fucking NSA? I don't think the NSA is like measurably destroying my life on a daily basis. I think there's more important things to worry about than the level of data collection the NSA is engaged in. Like what? Uh, well, we could talk about inflation recently or the economy. Um, we can talk about issues relating to the administration of the government. So things mm. like welfare, social security. Mm. Um, we can talk about like employment policies like minimum wage or closed shop laws. Um, we could talk about housing policies like zoning restrictions or um, how cities are arranged. Mm. We can talk about or like public transit. I mean, like all of these things would be more important. Healthcare is an important conversation we'd have in the United States. Something to do with homeless people in major cities is a fucking problem all over the United States. What do you think we should do about the homeless? <laughs> um, well. I know one guy who could answer that question, but he killed himself a long time ago. Who? Oh, I am. Uh, I agree. No, good Me one. Too. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I don't know. It's a, it's a hard problem, but the problem is the political will is not there because yeah. nobody gives a fuck about homeless people. Hmm. Do you think the political will isn't there? For homeless people? No, I don't think so. No? I think that when the political will is there, you can see changes happen. But the problem is there's a lot of, and this is part of why I don't like you or everybody in this fucking space. You don't is, like me? Yeah. The issue is that I think the anger ends up being misdirected, mm. right? So if I can point to a real problem, I think BLM is a really good example of this, mm -hmm. okay? There might be issues that exist with policing our criminal justice system throughout the United States. But like, what was the main narrative that was sold the entire time? That cops and the whole system is racist and everybody's a white supremacist. Well, okay. That's a whole bunch of anger. It got poured into that um, some police departments changed some people were fired some policies changed and then what happened everything got rolled back in like a year or two because it was mm -hmm. dog shit because it was a bad focus but i would say just as much on the other end for people on the far left that blame the government for everything or for people on the far right that blame the government and jews for everything well what is all that anger being directed towards like what, it, what at the end of the day you know how many times are you going to bring up the Mossad before they finally come down before the united states changes its foreign policy stance on israel and palestine or how many times are we going to complain about like the media and the government and everything and i've talked to conservative creators who will say things and they actually they get into the self-defeating progressive mindset you ever heard a bl black person say like oh i'm not going to do anything the system's rigged against me it's bullshit mm -hmm. right like i've argued with fucking lauren about her videos where she's like oh, all of my stuff is deprioritized. I don't think I'm getting views. Like, no, it's not. You just don't fucking upload enough. Make more fucking videos. And she did make a couple and some of them actually popped off on the algorithm. She did one responding to Matt Walsh. She got like half a million views. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why do you think that the algorithm's not fucking you? You're fucking yourself. Mm -hmm. Because that that type of like self-defeating, self-deprecating, like self-fulfilling prophecy of like the system's against me. I can't do anything. Um, so it gives you the perfect excuse to, to work on nothing because you're completely fucked. And then it gives you like the perfect enemy to blame for all of your problems. And it's like, well, what the fuck? What does that accomplish at the end of the day? What's up? Wait. To be a good wife. Oh, so I got peanut butter sandwiches. Whoa! Is it for him? For both. Let's go! Thanks, Isn't that what a mom. Wife is for? What? Isn't that what a wife is for? That is absolutely. Is. See, you got wow. it made, Thank bro. Thank you so much. Wow. Good job. Let's go. You Mel. got it made. Yo. Hold on. Mel. Yeah? I'm not stupid. 
Let's go. Why wow, do we get thanks. peanut butter sandwiches when you have Nutella in the cabinet? Oh. It's healthy. Do you want to? Okay. Really? No, that's okay. He's going to be really? You're going to no, tell okay. me to make another one? No, that's it's Nutella? okay. Don't worry about it. Really? I can make some Nutella sandwiches if you want to. Thanks. Okay. I'm good on this. Thank thanks. You. Let's go. But yeah, the self-defeating thing and then the hopeless, because how can you fight against an enemy that's everywhere all at once and controls all the structures of power all but the time? I, But I don't do that. You know that about me. You just told me the media and the government and the world's hegemony yeah, which, of the United States is all I'm fighting them. I'm fighting against that. Okay. We're, what do you mean, okay, I do a conference, I start a nonprofit, we do elections, like... I'm trying, we're trying to do that. I Because I tell people, people go on my show and they say, oh, you're wasting your time. They don't even count the votes, blah, blah, blah. And I say, fuck you. Don't you dare say that. We're going to get in there. If you change yourself, you can change the world. I tell people. Do you really? Not that particularly. Because <laughs> if you say that, that's a good line. But, but a I lot tell, of people tell me they say things, but I don't actually ever see them saying it. But. It's true. I tell people that. It, and this at the first AFTAC that I did, my first conference, I said is from an old friend of mine. It's a small group of people that can of highly motivated people that will change the world. We don't need to win fifty percent of the votes. We need ten thousand genius soldiers willing to dedicate their lives, and you could change the entire world. That's what it takes. That that's that's how it's always happened. So, anyways, I don't do that, and I think we can change things, but. What scares me is that we, I think there are hard limits set on what can be changed. And you say, oh, well, BLM had a bad focus. I don't think it's a coincidence that every time there's a popular movement, every time there's someone with a diehard following, it gets diverted, sidetracked, scandaled, someone gets killed, whatever. I think that there are people in power. They like to be in power. I don't know that they, I don't know to what extent they're vocalizing it or, or working explicitly in, in towards this end. But I think they're all working to basically keep their power. And that means the national security apparatus spying on and killing people. Can't there, and <clears throat> can we just say that like sometimes shit gets fucked? That yeah, that's like the sure. natural tendency of things to get fucked? That like, for instance, if we take a country yeah. and you throw it into chaos for long enough, radical groups are gonna emerge. Yeah. That's like a tale as old as time. Sure. If, say you take a bunch of people, you get them real mad, you put them outside the White House, even without some sort of plan, they're probably gonna break in and do shit, yeah. right? That's just like the nature of things. BLM run long enough, it's gonna do some crazy shit. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need a puppet master or somebody to be like a little conniving behind the scenes to like change the people's will or whatever. Like people just do dumb shit when they're like left alone too long and when groups are getting like further and further out of control. I, I agree, but I think that, as I agree with you, because it's very difficult to build things. Things are very fragile and it's, Taking something from nothing to something is a, very, is a very tough thing. But you look at the way things have been going in this country and you get the same winners all the time. Like the defense contractors are always the winners. The war party always gets war. Uh, the, and the same thing goes for, for big business. Big business well, is always the winner. Big business is always winning. Because it's big business. <laughs> yeah. If the small businesses were winning, they would become big business. <laughs> There's no, a no. reason why. Yeah. If you've got a small business and it's Saints. doing really well, they're going to become big, big business is always winning. That's why big business. Defense contractors are small. These guys are, these are small companies. Okay. These are market caps of like $150 billion. Okay. They're, I'm pretty sure we ship more iPhones and like the net worth of like the biggest three fucking contractors well, I, combined. And also- Where does all their money come from? It comes from the government. Sure. Now it comes from federal contracts. Apple's I'm just saying the idea that those are the country. ones leading the country, like, no shot. There's just not enough money there for them to be doing it. Certainly, of course. If, if their business is government contracts, they've got a way bigger interest in government than Apple does. Apple ha has an interest in government in so You don't think Apple has an interest when it comes to things like tariffing China that's what I'm saying. or trade in, policy? In terms of tariffs and regulation. You know, but, well, war impacts them as well. Nobody wants to be in a recession. That fucks companies like that the hardest. Like, it's hard quite. to sell a new iPhone every year when inflation is fucking 9%. The, the and, impact of the Iraq and Afghanistan war for Apple was negligible. Was it, though? It, if I were to look at the swings in stock markets at that time, you don't think it's possible that big tech companies no lost way. more in value than the entirety of our no war way. machine they combined? Don't, they don't spend money to lobby against war because it doesn't impact them. But, but the I, bread no, and no, butter it absolutely of the, the peanut butter them. and banana of Lockheed Martin is planes and missiles and ships and so they lobby the government and then the point is like this here's here's the the bottom line is the american people don't have a lobby the american people are not organized the defense industry is organized big agriculture is organized big pharma is organized 
it's all it's all these organi organized self-perpetuating systems against the people and the people are just sort of like hapless pawns and collateral damage whatever happens to those poor suckers that volunteered to fight in iraq because they had wmds those are just idiots that just got killed like and i don't mean to say that in a way that's insensitive but they were told the narrative about iraq and and to maybe about 9 11 you disagree obviously but they're being told this story they're going and fighting and dying for some for lockheed martin or whatever and nobody's there to say, hey, you know, what about the soldiers? Hey, what about the workers? Hey, what up? That's what our politicians are We are not are organized. Uh, we elect them. Uh, and there's the naivete. Do you really think the politicians are representing us and, and our interests? How do they get elected? They, by raising money. That's raising not true, huge though. Huge How of many money. that progressives have learned this now the hard way? Mm -hmm. Just because you raise a lot of money doesn't guarantee you anything for election results. Steyer and Bloomberg got crushed in their nomination cycle, and they were both billionaires. They outspent their adversaries a ton. Nina Turner just lost her second election, and she outspent the fuck out of her opponent, too. Like, just because you spend more, look at how much Cenk spent on his election, how popular he was online. He got fucking nothing for it. Um, the, the idea that, like, just spending money is a way to win elections isn't true. Does the money normally track? Yeah, sure, but where do politicians raise the majority of their money from? It's from donations, from people that are donating to them. So of course the yeah, most popular, like who raised the most money when it came, when it was um, four years ago or whatever, right? The top two for small donations were Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Donald Trump was number one. But like, of course he was, he was insanely fucking popular. I don't need a conspiracy yeah, to explain what, where Trump well, got his money from. He got it because he was really popular. And what happened to Bernie? They screwed Bernie out of the nomination. Bernie was never Bernie was never popular enough to win the Democratic primary. Sure he was. He won the Iowa caucus, he won in New Hampshire, he won in Nevada, and then everybody dropped out and threw their support Those are Biden. very, very white states. You need more than that to carry the Democratic yeah, ticket. That, that's what they say. They say that, oh, then Biden won all the blacks in South Carolina. I just South don't Ca that, that. Super Tuesday is a big fucking deal. What do you mean you don't believe it? The, Biden was pulling ahead literally the entire time and then he won the entire time. Same I, thing with Hillary Clinton. The story of Hillary Clinton and Biden is really funny. When you look at it in the moment, and I know this because um, you're young for this, but I used to be a Ron Paul guy. I used to be a Ron you Paul guy. You were a Ron Paul guy? I was guy? a huge Ron no Paul way. guy. No way. Way really? back. In 2008? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah dude. Ron really? Paul what happened, forever. man? What happened? Ron Paul forever. Um, what happened? You well, I saw so Ron nice. Paul's son, who was a fucking loser, and that's Rand what happened. Paul? Yeah, oh, Rand Paul? Oh, Rand Paul's a good man. Oh, my God. But anyway, the story of Biden and Hillary was candidate that is pulling massively in the lead in the beginning ends up winning massively by the end. Mm. Retrospectively, they're really boring. Now, in the heat of the moment, it's like, okay, well, if Bernie can win Iowa, and then he can steamroll this into a big, then Super Tuesday, can win. like, people will make up all this insane math to figure out in the heat of the moment what's going on. But the reality was, Hillary and Biden were both really far ahead as soon as they were doing polling on them. And then they ended up winning. Nothing unexpected happened there. Unless you get lost in the middle of, like, all of the narratives, and you're like, well, if this happens, and the super delegates are ringing this, and black people aren't voting the right way, then it looks kind of weird. But well, it, well, the writing I mean, was on the wall the entire you time. You saw how it worked out. Elizabeth Warren was a spoiler for the progressives because she stayed in the she was she stayed in the race long enough to pull support from Bernie and Kamala and all the other establishment people dropped up, dropped out, and endorsed Biden. I mean, I, I don't remember exactly the timeline, but I watched the 2020 primary very closely. Bernie was steamrolling Biden. You're right, Biden won in South Carolina. He was polling better in South Carolina. But then the dynamic of the race changed, and all the establishment all the establishment people dropped out, threw their support behind Biden almost exactly at the same time. Warren remained as a spoiler to pull support from Bernie. Wait, <clears> but and, um, doesn't that make sense? What? Let's say that it's it's starting to look like there's no path forward, mm -hmm. and there's one guy that's probably going to make it, and everybody else around you starts dropping out. Do you want to drop out and cut a deal so you've got some type of like place in that administration? Yeah, or do you I'm want to start or do you want to start pushing forward and be like, no, I'm gonna fight you to the fucking end? And yeah, now you I, fucked your political career. Like, I agree. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. I'm just well, saying. Well, but you, hold on, you're making it sound like it was almost done conspiratorially. But I yeah. think that it was more just like, well, fuck it. I want like a place in your administration, like I'll work with you, I'll drop out or whatever. That's probably more likely what's happening. Sure. But point being is Bernie well, that's Sanders. A big, that's an important difference. <laughs> Well, no, I don't. I actually don't think the details are very important. That's super important. The well, difference between you're arguing that the politicians represent the people, but you said that they dropped out because they wanted to get a job in the Biden administration. So, so whether, that they could, so the, oh, so, so that they, they could represent the people. Career, yeah. So they could if help you're their a career. supporter of Elizabeth Warren. And she's got two options. She can either go all the way to in the primary and have nothing, uh -huh. or she's reasonably popular. She drops out and she gets some yeah, position. That's in the why government. Buttigieg became the transportation secretary, because he cares so much about the people, not because the guy's a sociopath who wanted to be president since he was in the womb, right? That's good. 
You want politicians to want to be popular. That's the whole point of a politician is to get more votes to get elected. So if they're doing things to make themselves more popular, isn't no. that exact? Like, they're yeah. not supposed to do things to make themselves unpopular. You want them to do the right thing. You don't want them. Well, the, hold on. No, that is not true. Yeah. You don't want a politician true. to do the right thing. You yeah, want, absolutely. You want the politician to do what you want them to do. No, you want them to do what's in the interest of the nation. To do but what's that, good that, for the what nation. is in the interest of the nation is going to vary from voter to voter. No, it's totally objective. It's what, absolutely what, you're, it's totally on, you're just wrong. People want prosperity. What's what's in the interest of the country is wealth, security, these kinds of things. Now, it's not a, what people want. Everybody really we wants want, like, the same thing. Ultimately, no, what, everybody wants the same thing on a foundational level. Yeah, but no, but the abstractions of that are going to be where the fighting yeah. is. Right? Well, yeah, well, like everybody wants to be happy and healthy. Do we need socialized health care? Well, there's going to be disagreements there. There's not an objectively. There's not an objectively correct answer. So it's not like politicians that are acting like, you can't say that Rand Paul is objectively correct and AOC is objectively incorrect or whatever. Like there's gonna be disagreements there. Right. And the goal of a politician is to represent the people's wishes that voted for them, not to do the objectively correct thing. Because well, there's obviously policy disagreements. I disagree, I don't think- How can you disagree that there are policy disagreements? Because, well, what I disagree with is that I think that politicians exercising their mandate, I think is lame. I think we want a leader who is going to do what is objectively, and you could say, yeah, like, well, how to do those things is- You want a monarchy. Theory. Yeah, I want a, like a Putin. I want a guy like Putin to go in and do what is in the best interest of the country. And the best interest is not really up for debate. Like there's not a debate between do we want a rich country or a poor country, a safe country or an unsafe country. We want those things. That we, is a debate. You would debate that. We don't you would want, say I don't want a rich country if it comes no, at the cost wouldn't. of having if it comes at the cost of having a lot of immigrants. Or I don't want a really rich country if it comes at the cost of giving this tech company like free reign over who they ban or don't ban. I don't want a rich country if it means Hollywood cucking out to Jewish people and multi-diversity shit on every single movie, right? So even that question of like, because you yourself, and I know that if I go on your streams, I know you said this before, we have to stop measuring everything in GDP. So you don't just want prosperity or you don't just want wealth. There are other things that you're factoring in there as well. Okay, but you're talking about a metric. You're not talking about wealth. I mean, say, oh, I'm sorry, wealth with a capital W with president, or like, what do you mean? Like, that's well, gonna be up I for mean, debate. All of these things are up for debate. Oh, that's the please. whole point. Saying that you want a wealthy country is not up for debate. If you want a wealthy country, here's, this is objectively true. Uh -huh. More people is always better. Yeah, well, it's a, well, not necessarily. No, no, yeah. not necessarily. Absolutely. Not necessarily. It's always going to grow the GDP of your country to have more people. Okay, but Workers are a resource. About, but it's not just about the GDP. We just went over that. What else is it about? It's about quality of life. And it, depending on the people, depending on the people that are there, it can sure. change quality of cool. life. Cool. And now, now we're into the realm of the subjective arguments. Yeah, but, you st but the point is, is like... You, everybody wants to have a good life, and a good life means safety, and a good life you're, means prosperity. Okay, if somebody says the phrase begging the question, have you ever heard that before? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I've been I'll explain for chat that doesn't know, okay? Because yeah. a lot of people think begging the question means raising the question. When you beg the question, it's where you smuggle in the conclusion with the question, or the conclusion with the statement. So when you say, everybody wants a good life, mm -hmm. of course, but that's not an interesting statement. The question is, what is a good life? Well, that's listen, where the argument is going to be, right? Or, because some people would say, like, having a group of Mexican people that I can go down and buy tamales from or whatever, that's a good life. And other people would say, I don't want ethnic enclaves in my country okay. where they can barely speak English. What's yeah. the answer there, well, right? That's a hard... Yeah, well, we're, we're getting in the weeds here. The point, the original point... I love the weeds. Is well, yeah, I know you do. The point, but then we have to take actual positions on things, but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I agree. But the thing is, the fundamental question we're talking about is... Um, you know, why did these people drop out of the race? Is it because they were doing something popular? Is it because they were doing something for their career? Did they do something for their career to be popular, do something for their career to help the people? The thing is, is that pop, I'm, what I'm trying to say is this, becoming popular or becoming a successful politician actually almost always has nothing to do with doing what is in the best interest of the people. That's what I'm trying to say. And that the the whole system is flawed because you can have popular politicians and you can have politicians that have great careers and you have politicians who do a lot of things, but they don't do the things that are in the best interest of the people. Okay, so and then let's answer me this then, because I think that this example is completely contrary. Yeah. Let's say you're a huge Pete Buttigieg fan. What should he have done that was in your best interest? Because it feels like him dropping out to get a role in Biden's administration, that is in his interest. And it's in my interest if I'm a supporter of his. So what should he have done otherwise? Just rant till the end? Well, we're talking about, we're not talking, but the thing is, if he's fighting for my best interest, and well, what's the question? <laughs> You're using the primaries as an example of yeah. them being self-serving. They're not fighting for the interests of their constituents, they're just trying to further their own careers. Well, and we're what we're I'm talking saying about is small I'm a supporter. dollar contributions and... I think Bernie we're talking about the primaries and the people running them and collaborating well, to drop out. Originally, you said, well, I well, said- Well, we're not talking about, we're not originally. Here's where we are right now, okay? If I'm a supporter of Warren, or I'm a mm -hmm. supporter of Buttigieg, or any of these other guys, or anybody that got a role in Biden's administration, right. 
wouldn't I want them to drop out so that I at least have that representation? If I was a huge Pete Buttigieg fan, I'm happier that he's in the Department of Transportation now instead of just somebody that dropped out and now he's nobody. Wouldn't that be what I want? Uh, not necessarily because, you know, if you're a guy like, well, I guess Pete Buttigieg isn't a radical. I guess none of these guys are radicals. Um, because the thing is they could have all dropped out and if, and I'm not like a Bernie bro or whatever, but Biden clearly, well, you would even disagree with that. You would disagree that Biden has like mental problems or whatever, right? Or do you, do you think he does? He's getting old. Oh, he's okay. He's getting old. He's getting old. Point being is, and so I don't, I don't believe in the Bernie Sanders message, but you could say that Bernie Sanders, well, you would disagree with this too, because you would say that there aren't as many progressives as people there think there are, yeah, which I, I would actually agree with that to some extent. The reason why it matters, you're originally saying, <laughs> is because you gave a, an example of Bernie being a guy that was supported by small dollar contributions, and that mm -hmm. shows that money doesn't control politics because he raised more money, et cetera, et cetera. And I said that, well, they screwed Bernie out of the nomination. You said, well, they didn't screw him out of the nomination. They just did what was in their best interest. They dropped out to get a position in the cabinet. I don't think that these people are in politics for the best interest of the people. I think that they dropped out, it was good for their career, and they care about the career. And you argue basically that the system works. And so yeah, I'm arguing that what's good for their career is right, probably what's good for, for the yeah. people. And but I you haven't disagree with But that. you haven't just proven that. Don't I want a politician to do the things that's gonna make them more popular when they get their power from their popularity? Isn't that what I want them to well, do? I think that, uh, I think that popularity mm. is sometimes a spook. Because where does public perception come from? That's where you get into the importance of the media and the conversation, which this is really all about, which is about the power of propaganda and mass Which I think perception. was totally disproved in 2016 when a candidate like Trump that nobody thought had a snowball's chance in hell that was constantly derided by the media right. swept the fucking election. Yeah, because he pierced through it all. I, I think so, but hold on. Those can't both be true. That was my statement. Yeah, they you just took be. my statement. What do you mean? <laughs> if the media is so powerful and all this propaganda and everything is working and changing people's minds, how the fuck did Trump come and just clean up? Because, well, I mean, to say that the media isn't like all powerful isn't to say that they're not ridiculously powerful. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the history of Trump, the debates were rigged against Trump. The money was rigged against Trump. And then throughout the Trump presidency was rigged against him between the special counsel, the impeachment, constant. I mean, you look at the amount of negative press coverage he got. You can't say that that was the result of a free marketplace of media. He got like 95% bad coverage from most media outlets. Sure, he is also like an incredibly divisive person. It's not that surprising. Yeah, and so me. was Obama. Obama, Obama was, was divisive nowhere too. near as divisive Total as Trump. Well, he, Trump he might have been, he might have been less bombastic. Exactly. The bombasticness of Trump was one of his huge draws. I, I but of course, that that you're going to know. I think that's, that's just naive to say that like, well, the difference between Trump and Obama is that, well, you know, Trump was, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll agree. I Trump feel, this was is like more a, impolite. This is like a Keffel's argument. Why is that a Keffel's? What? I don't know if I, is. If I go into some community mm -hmm. and I interact, I'm more tame today, but if I interact in the way that I interacted like three or four years ago, yeah. I imagine there's going to be a huge uprising against me, but I don't think it's a coordinated thing. I don't think somebody's planning like some raid against me. I think I just have a certain bombastic attitude that's going to predictably incite people and galvanize people against me. Mm -hmm. That's always been the case with the stuff that I do. So you think that the reason that the media was very positive towards Obama and the reason the media was overwhelmingly negative towards Trump was because of their personal temperament? I think the temperament... Because I, I don't think that the temperament accounts for that differential. That's what I'm temperament saying. Temperament is huge. Oh, please. It's the president. We're literally seeing the Finnish fucking uh, woman PM or whatever getting attacked right now for what is arguably temperament, which was her partying. So what about what about a guy like, for example, uh, do you know Jared Taylor? Yes. Jared Taylor has a very placid temperament, wouldn't okay. you say? Yeah. But they but look at what they accuse him of. He's a literal media. white supremacist. Okay, but it's got nothing to do with his temperament. <laughs> no, but I well, there's going to be temperament and ideas, of course. But I'm saying just because you have a good temperament, that's not enough to take you far. It's about but ideas. Bet, no, no, no. Things can be deal breakers. Like, for instance, let's say that I go and I meet a girl and then I come back and nothing happened. And you're like, oh, well, what happened? It's like, I don't know, dude. Like, I took a shower before you and I smelled fine. You're like, that's not enough to, to seal the deal. Now, if you smell like shit, that might be enough to close the deal, but it's not enough to get there. Having a good temperament is like a baseline to be like respected as a leader or a human being. So Trump having a dog shit temperament, just because he, if he would have had a good temperament, that's not enough to make him palatable. Well, he still would have got a lot like, of pushback, so, but he had like the worst temperament of any president so ever. you're saying that like he had 95% negative coverage or whatever, 91%, you would agree that it was overwhelmingly, almost universally negative. Is that right? Mm -hmm. From most media. 
And you're telling me that that's because, again, because Trump, in terms of his policies, was not really that radical. Not actually at all. He's right. Actually, so you'll yeah. agree. In terms of policy, he wasn't, he wasn't really that much different than, than even, his, even his Democrat predecessors. Sure. He was even okay. saying some stuff about, like, uh, Planned Parenthood can get federal funds when he was learning initially. Yeah, right. he was pretty— and, and about universal health care to some extent. Yeah. So, so if you agree that his policies weren't that radical— and you also agree that it was overwhelmingly negative towards him. You think that it was overwhelmingly negative in spite of the moderate policies, even compared to Obama. So, and that differential is accounted for because he was like impolite. And, there's and a there's a there's a name bombastic. for there's a name for this, but I don't remember it. But the issue is that when oftentimes we look at a leader, we're not normal human beings don't look at a leader and like absorb in the totality of all of their policy positions. They're looking at kind of like, what are those things that they're staking their reputation on the most? Mm. So I would actually agree that I think Trump was actually kind of surprisingly moderate yeah. given the neocons that came before him for some of his positions. But what were the things that he talked about the most? They were some of his most extreme positions. One was immigration, and the other was kind of like this broad concept of like isolationism for America. And these were two things that he staked almost all of his reputation on. So if you talk about like policies being kind of moderate, like Bush would have never talked about, uh, well, I was gonna say Bush wouldn't have talked about deporting DACA kids, but DACA didn't exist yet. Uh, but Bush would be talking about like deporting, like fucking, uh, like Reagan talked about amnesty and shit. Yeah. Um, the, the way that he focused on illegal immigration, on people here, the statements and comments that he made about Mexicans yeah. or other people here, um, these are the things when people look at Trump, you know, his whole, he might be here on the political spectrum, and, you know, past neocons might have been here on the political spectrum, but the only opinion they're seeing from Trump is this one right here, because okay. it's the most radical ones that yeah, I think he but focused see, here, here's on. Like, he's thing. literally sending the military to the border to work on his fucking border wall and shit, and he's attacking the media like crazy okay. in ways that have never been seen before. Talking about, I want to open libel laws to sue the media for saying bad things about me? It's pretty scary when a president's doing that. Okay, but... To get to the point, though, and this is this is why I keep asking you. To, yeah, I, well, hold on. So ask me a question, I'll answer. Yeah, yeah. Go. So you think that again? That's because of his temperament. Because Trump the temperament was played a lot into and, it. Yes. And said those things. Mm -hmm. See, and that's where I would disagree with you and say that so obviously it is because Trump represented the antithesis of the establishment. That's why they hated him. It's because it was ideologically driven. It had nothing to do with his temperament because nah. the policies weren't even, even that radical. You, even you don't agree with this, and I know this because any Republican or anybody that's more extreme on your end, you know this, mm -hmm. even if you won't admit it, that Trump could have been a much more effective leader with a better temperament. That dude- No, I disagree. I disagree oh my God, you're that. so wrong. I disagree with he that could have. He could have moved mountains, the no ones way. that all of our data are, are buried in. Uh, no in way, the whatever. But that, but he could have done, if he would have been, that's why everybody on the left, and even people on the right look at DeSantis and they're like, oof, this is a guy that's pretty far right, but this is a much more effective leader. Trump was DeSantis a dog shit sucks. leader, largely because of his temperament. No. Trump threw every motherfucker that he worked with under the bus. He was horrible at choosing allies. That's because How they betrayed him constantly. Whose fault is that? Well, that was the traitor's fault. <laughs> no, that's part of being a good. No, that's part no. of a good being a and good here, leader. Here's why they betrayed him. They betrayed him because it, it was a tough road. Trump pushed a radical agenda. America First was a radical agenda. You're right. During the campaign, we talked about opening the libel laws, deporting everybody. It was radical. The pressure was on. People do what's easy, and and I when people say, oh, we could have accomplished so much more, it's like. No, he accomplished so much because his temperament was so unconventional. But he didn't. No, he didn't he accomplish so, anything. That was the. He became the president. He became the president. He built five hundred miles of border wall. He renegotiated NAFTA. First, okay, first of all, have you seen the USMCA or whatever? The renegotiated. Yeah, it's not much different. I yeah. Okay. Nice try. So na though it's almost identical to NAFTA. But he did. He did become the president. <laughs> he did become the president, which was not that impressive. And whoa, whoa! It wasn't that impressive. No. How is that not impressive? Because just becoming the, the president doesn't mean that you're do what it, it's never been done before. Here's the sad thing. Do you know the outsider? Most, it's never been done. What before. is the most effective thing that Trump did? The most well, I, I'll agree. It was Supreme Court judges, yeah. which is what he it's kind of a gimme when you're the president, unless you're Obama and the Republicans. Yeah, are I agree party. with that. I agree yeah. with that. So, in legislatively, Biden has already accomplished like ten times more than Trump did legislatively. Okay. But but he's the president. But okay. here, wait, you're, I, you're I, arguing I, things that I'm not you're, sure. Okay, fine. Not here, but this is my big this is my big underpinning. Okay, and this is what pisses me off. I got experience being a leader. I was a supervisor in a restaurant, okay? Is, yeah. Yeah. You know what happens if my manager were to come into my restaurant uh -huh. and my tables are fucked up and she were to say, hey, just let you know, dining room was fucked up tonight when I walked by, VP of food and beverage was with me, we weren't happy. Mm -hmm. Do you know what they would do to me if I would say, okay, well, listen, Samantha and Toby were supposed to be busting that night. I'd probably just get fired. 
If I were to start throwing my employees, because it's my fucking responsibility. Yeah, there's I, a well, reason I why I get paid more, I and there's a reason you. why I'm in charge of like. I agree. Shows. I so, agree. And, but this, the thing that irritates me is that was Trump's biggest selling point. I'm gonna run things like a leader. I'm gonna be a business. I know. Leader. I know. So for him to come in and for people like you to give a guy, well, he happened to chose all. He chose all the bad people and everybody around him. Well, that's not on. part of being a leader. Oh, that's on. not part of being a businessman. Uh -huh. well, you have to make those calls. I, and surrounding yourself with who you want to surround yourself with. No disagreement for me. I've done a show. He didn't make Manafort do fucked up deals with Ukraine before he was even part of his cabinet yeah. and that was a yeah sorry because I, I, I would because I, I would agree with you I've done my show every day since he became president talking about how he had horrible personnel and it's his fault the buck stops with him I agree with all that but you're talking about temperament versus personnel decisions you're talking about his tweets his rhetoric his tweets and his rhetoric and his temperament are one thing his personnel selection it really came down to a few bad selections it really did because he chose Ryan's Priebus to lead PPO and lead the well he chose Priebus and then DiStefano led PPO and those guys are responsible for filling up the White House. Also he had Kushner and he had Ivanka and they he had Ben Carson as the head of transportation as well. And, well he, he had was fucking head of, uh, HUD, Ben actually. Oh sorry and HUD, Car yeah, and Carson yeah. was horrible actually because I know people that work sure, in Sure he had Steve and, Bannon whispering in his ear doing some dumb shit he but, had, here, but, but, like, but <laughs> to get to the point you're not I don't disagree with you that his personnel is bad and I don't disagree with you that that was a huge letdown. You don't think his temperament his was a problem? If he no. could have just pulled it back a little bit, you don't think he would have been far more effective as a leader? The temperament wasn't the issue. The issue was he trusts the wrong people. That was the issue there. He trusted bad people. And no, and there's no disagreement, by the way, because I, I know all the people on the you, scene. If Trump would have come out and Trump would have said, I want to keep this country safe because that's my job as president. No. There are seven countries that the Obama administration identified as being hazardous countries to American no safety, and we're gonna add them to the to the no immigrant list. You think if he would've said that instead of, before the election, he's like, I wanna ban all Muslim immigration, no way. and I'm gonna ban everybody, and then he, I think he reached out to Giuliani, he's like, how is the way that I can legally get all immigrants banned that are Muslim? And he said this. I you know. Don't think, you don't think that affected a little bit his, his drive to get some of his immigration policy passed? No, that made him more popular. He went oh up in God. the polls after oh that, Oh my dude. God. That, right. that the total Trump Trump campaign bears this out. He was the most bombastic, he was the most offensive, and he blew everybody. That was a field with 17 people. If what you're saying is true, why did one out of any of those 17, like, I'm not Cruz looking, but example, this is, I, this is why I'm just video. I'm not looking is at Nico him. Is calling? I, yeah, I guess Woo, he was. Let's go. Yo, uh, you guys Party. debating?